And we should be live, according to this software, for today's Let's Go Tribe Q&A. Uh, I hope that you're warm, wherever you are. I can confirm, unfortunately, it's still snowing here in Chicago. It's been snowing here in Chicago for a while. And it's not any fun to have to deal with. A couple of things I want to talk about today. First, are the Indians going to pull off the move for Edwin Encarnacion? I hope so. Uh, are we... I, I want to go over the Rule 5 draft as well. We can talk about how terrible my hair looks today, which is why I'm wearing a hat. These are all things that could come up. If you've got questions, go ahead and post them. We're going to... I'm going to get to those here a little bit later on in the show. But I do always like to take a look at those since this is... Of course, the Q&A. Happy Sunday to you too, Ryan. Uh, excited to have you here. Just going to see. Yeah, there's still like six inches of snow outside. So <laughs> this show could run a little longer than normal. Just to get started, I do want to talk about the Rule 5 draft. Uh, if you don't understand the Rule 5 draft, that's fine. Uh, I think that I do. But I'm not totally sure. Uh, to make a long story short, if you've been in the minor leagues for a little while, you're eligible to be signed by other baseball teams. So this year, the prospect Anthony Santander of the Indians was picked up in the Rule 5 draft by the Baltimore Orioles. It was the 18th overall pick of the major league phase. This means that the Orioles have to keep Santander on the roster, on the 25-man roster, so he's got to be active duty for the entire season, and the Indians get $100,000. Ooh, that'll help them sign Edwin. If they don't keep Santander on the roster for that entire year, he goes back to the Indian system, and the Orioles only get, I think, $50,000 back. So, he was at High A Lynchburg the entire year, hit 290 with 20 home runs, and 95 batted in. Uh, this is really the first year he's not been hurt, so... Some of us are thinking that he's a pretty high-ceiling prospect. Maybe not quite on the level of uh, Bobby Bradley or Francisco Mejia, both of whom raked earlier this year uh, in the lower to mid-minor leagues as well. But it, it, just, it doesn't seem like this is the kind of guy that the Orioles are going to be able to keep on the 25-man roster the entire year. If it happens, it'll be because the Orioles start the season and are terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, because at that point, they're not playing for anything. Why not keep the guy on the roster? He's a prospect. So we kind of want to hope the Orioles do pretty well next year. Uh, some of the other things that happened in the Roll 5 draft. I'm going to close this drawer real quick. Sorry about that. <clears throat> this is the first time I've done the broadcast from this room because I got a new computer and a new webcam partially for this. Really putting my best foot forward there. Anyway, <laughs> in the AAA portion of the draft, there are multiple portions of the Rule 5 draft, by the way. A uh, bunch of different players got picked. Uh, the Indians lost Grant Sides, Trevor Frank, Nick Morand, and John Fitzsimmons. They're gone. If you're picked in the minor league portion of the Rule 5 draft, there's no contingencies. So, this was... Sides was a 12th round pick in 2011. Frank was an 8th round pick in 2013. Morand was a 3rd round pick in 2011. Um, by the Angels, actually, but got traded to us for cash considerations. Had um, split time between AA and AAA. Just to... Just to paint a picture of Morand, in AA he was a 219 ERA guy. In AAA he's a 424 guy. Maybe the Indian system just isn't going to work for him. The last guy was Fitzsimmons. It was organizational depth. That was the reason that the Indians had him, because they traded away six players at the deadline and released some, so they needed a guy in a uniform at Lake County. So, anytime someone gets lost like this, it's usually someone the organization doesn't think very highly of. Just as an interesting counterpoint to that, though, there is an interesting list of 
guys who were picked in the Rule 5 draft over time. Uh, the top players since 1990, here's just a quick list on MLB.com. Josh Hamilton, Johan Santana, Dan Ugla, Shane Victorino, Joachim Soria, uh, and then you start falling into guys like Willie Tavares and Scott Pesednik. So like, like that's kind of the ceiling here. If one of these guys turns out to be an all-star, well then, damn it, shucks. But this is like, tw damn it, shucks. This is like 26 years of picks, and the number five guy on the list is Joachim Soria. And number eight is Scott Pesednik. Not many of these guys end up being, um, well, one, sticking with the team that picks them, because these are all guys that ended up staying with that team, and then two, being great contributors. So we shall see. Uh, we'll take a look here. Uh, as Kerry points out, it seems like they're focused on negotiations with Mike Napoli instead of talking to Edwin Encarnacion's camp. I do know that they have been taking a look at Napoli here pretty deep, and not all the comments are coming up here because the desktop app sucks. So I'm going to pull up on my phone, and I apologize but we do that. I think they want to get Napoli back. I've said it before. I don't want it to be a three-year deal. I'm concerned that we squeezed all of the baseball out of Mike Napoli and that none of the baseball is left in Mike Napoli. He's a wonderful guy to have on the team. I absolutely appreciate what he was able to do for the Indians this year. It's just... <sighs> With guys coming up like Yandy Diaz with the ability to maybe still go out and get Edwin Encarnacion. I would prefer they try to do something like that. If we do end up signing, I think any signings the Indians are going to do are going to be after the new year. It'll be kind of like last year where they slow play it, see where the market is, and since there's still top-tier guys like that that haven't come up, I think that's kind of why they haven't gone for a trade or made a decision yet. We did hear that they were in talks with guys like Matt Holliday, uh, a little bit on Mitch Moreland, some of the other first basemen that have been picked as well. But it, it's winter meetings. You're going to ask about pretty much anybody who's available just to see what teams are saying the cost is, what you can possibly do. So we'll see what happens. Some other questions coming in, and here's a fun one. Mark asks, why do they have the Rule 5 draft? And then Anthony does point out, yeah, it keeps teams from stockpiling talent. So they, it's not like college football where Ohio State has probably four running backs yeah, um, that could compete at the top level in Division One football. Baseball doesn't want that to happen. They want talent to be distributed as well as possible. So even if you've got a totally stacked farm system, some of those guys in the system, if they don't rise very quickly through it, are going to be uh, picked away by other teams. It's, it's a weird thing. I don't know of <laughs> any other sport that has something like the Rule 5 draft, but it's baseball. We love it because it's weird. We still have umps calling balls and strikes. So, maybe maybe not that's a reason to love the game. But that is why it's there, is to keep people from stockpiling. I just imagine if the Yankees or someone could keep tons of prospects in AAA. It's not fair to the prospects, it's not fair to the rest of the league. So, some of the other questions. Aaron wants to know, can we repeat and get back into the World Series next year? I think so. Um, I think so. I feel good. I like the core that we have. What I'm thinking about the Indians for next year is that Jose Ramirez is probably going to regress a little bit. I think he's the real deal, but I don't know if... I think next year's his age 24 season. It's either 24 or 25, so he's still very young. I don't know if he necessarily has as good a year again. I think he's going to be able to play at that level long term, but he might take a step back. 
Michael Brantley, we know, is going to be back, allegedly, by spring training. He's going to start swinging the bat after Christmas. He's still kind of a key. I know we've been saying this for months now, is what kind of improvement can he have? What kind of bat is he going to bring back to the team? Because if you look at it, the Indians could use another really good bat in the lineup, possibly at a corner outfield spot. That could be what Michael Brantley is. Oh, I hope that his shoulder repairs itself nicely. But as long as we don't have a huge step back from guys like Carrasco or Bauer or Salazar, and as long as Kipnis, who's I think going to turn 30 next year, which is weird, as long as they continue to produce at a very a good level, not I mean Kipnis is probably not going to make the Hall of Fame someday, I would love to eat crow on that statement in 20 years, trust me. But he's an all-star caliber player. He's not one of the all-time greats. As long as he stays there and some of the other guys do that too, I really like the chances. The division is going to be a piece of cake, I think. Um, if the Indians don't win the division next year, I would be shocked. The question is going to come again in the playoffs. Um they're going to have to get through the Red Sox, probably. As we know, they went out and got Chris Sale. So they now arguably have the second best starting rotation in the game with, I think, three. I think it's three Cy Young winning pitchers. Yay! Uh, and then whoever ends up coming out of uh, the other divisions as well, it'll be interesting to see what they can put together. But I say. With what the Indians have in place here, it's just it, we're looking for that one piece to try and win the World Series. It's not that one piece to get to the playoffs. It's just if the Indians put themselves in that position again, let's get that bat that can do it. Um, Kerry points out, apparently Jordan Bastian pointed or posted some interesting things on Twitter. I'm assuming this is about Napoli's strike zone since August, which... <laughs> To me, and I'm not looking at the numbers here, it just feels like he was watching a lot of pitches. So this is good stuff, and it is in the last hour. If you follow Jordan Bastion on Twitter, you should. If you don't follow Jordan Bastion on Twitter, you should. If you do, you can go look at it. But it's MLB Bastion, so ML Bastion is his Twitter handle. Wow. So basically, on the outside corner of the plate and then up, he was 0-20 from August 15th through the end of the season. Before that, he was 16-46 of with a slugging percentage of 957, which is crushing it. That's a huge drop-off. And maybe it's a small enough sample size for us to think maybe that's just a slump. But, man, that combined with the fact that it just felt like he was just sitting there looking at these pitches, breaking balls, too, on the outside corner of the plate. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. He did lead the team in the number of home runs with exit velocities of above 107 miles an hour, although the hardest hit home run of the year was by Francisco Lindor. Beautiful. Uh, and Kerry does point out pitchers adjusted to Napoli's slump towards the end of the year. and they, they certainly did. We saw the same thing with Tyler Naquin. Pitchers started to figure out that he literally can't hit a high fastball. And he got a steady diet of those the rest of the year. Other questions. Ryan has a little bit here on Napoli. Says he's accused of been trying to pop a payday. I didn't know, does Mike Napoli have sleep apnea? Or did he have sleep apnea? If he does, I missed that entirely. Or if he did, I missed that entirely. Um, definitely good to have that under control, because if you're an uh, athlete, you need to have rest. You need to be able to perform. I, apparently, he did struggle with it. And I agree, we could land a better hitter at first base at this point. My thought is that the biggest benefits he brings are as sort of a mentor. We always kind of talk about the role Jason Giambi played on some of the older teams. 
I think he's definitely more valuable than that as a player still. But to me, and let's just get into it now. Uh, if they can get Edwin Encarnacion, they need to do it. Jonah Carey joked on Twitter the other day that if if the Indians can find some extra cash between the couch cushions, they've got to go for it. And I absolutely agree. If they can do it, if there's a way, this is one of those signings that I think... That, well, there's no precedent for it for the Indians. It, maybe Juan Gonzalez, but that was a one-year deal. And whatever. This would have to be a multi-year deal. It would have to be an interesting-looking contract. I talked about it on the podcast last week. What they're going to have to do if they can get him, excuse me, is probably structure it like the Cespedes deal, where, and let me, I want to make sure I'm referencing it correctly. I think it was like a four-year deal no, he just signed a four-year deal, but he signed a deal last year or the year before that I think was a three- or four-year deal where he had an option after the first season. So he took a little bit of a discount in that first year, which incentivizes the player to have as big a year possible because if he had hit, say, 50 home runs, he's walking on that deal and signing another one because he could go out and probably get a $25 million a year contract with that kind of season. So I think the Indians should take a look at doing the same sort of thing. We know that he, that Encarnacion turned down a four-year, $80 million deal with the Blue Jays. I think that at the start of free agency, that looked like the right choice for, in, choice for Encarnacion. But now that the market has changed, a lot of other players have signed already, I think that it's possible the Indians could get him for a little bit less per year than that, or close to it. It would easily be the largest per year contract the Indians have given out in free agency. I honestly don't expect the team to do it. Part of the concern is... Not enough people showing up to the stadium for them to be able to afford that kind of contract, but it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you're an ownership group that doesn't show that you're willing to invest in a winning team and do what it takes to continually make it to the playoffs, then fans are going to be less likely to show up and continually support the team. I will say them going out and trading for Andrew Miller and trying to trade for Luke Roy, it gives me some hope that things are changing. They're recognizing the window that the Indians are in. They might take a crack at it. I hope it's a guy like Encarnacion. I'm glad they didn't sign a guy like Mitch Moreland, who's been a little bit better than replacement level for a lot of his career. They're just going to have to get creative on the contract to try to find a way to do it if they do. And I hope they do. A quick pause here while I despair over the weather. Nope. Not, 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 I'm just not going to go outside for the rest of the day. The gym will be there. It can wait. I'll catch up with it later. A couple of other questions here. Uh, I, I guess Napoli would only sleep two or three hours a night when he was in Boston. That's terrifying. And he apparently had jaw surgery to fix it. And Mark, I really wish the Indians had millions in the couch cushions. Uh, if that's something that they've got at Wayside Furniture, we should all go. And we'll, let's just buy all of their furniture at that point. And that would be delightful. I don't necessarily have anything concrete from here. Just to talk a little bit more about what's going on with Let's Go Tribe, I think the other Matt Lyons and Brian Heminger are going to do a prospect chat 
on Tuesday is coming up here. I don't know if that's going to be a podcast or if it's going to be like a post that's a roundtable discussion from them. But the Indians do have a really interesting situation right now with prospects where it seems like there's a couple guys that are ready and there's a couple guys at the lower levels that could be superstars. So that should be a fun thing to follow. I'm looking forward to it. You should as well. We're going to start a Twitch stream. Uh, I'm going to do a bizarro uh, out-of-the-park baseball game with the Indians. Uh, if you're not familiar with out-of-the-park, it's kind of like... <laughs> it's a simulated baseball management game. It's kind of like a cross between, I would say, Dwarf Fortress, which is an entire other tangent I could go on, and I won't. Because one show can only be so nerdy. Um, and a sports game. It's a really in-depth simulator. We ran a test last night with the webcam. It looks like it's going to be pretty fun. So my goal is to try to do... I think it's going to be Wednesday nights at like 9 Eastern or so. We're going to do a season per week. Uh, just blast through the season. See how far we can get until opening day. Maybe do a couple seasons in one night. Just to have like an interesting... Fun thing to see, what could this Indians core that we've built conceivably do with a maniac at the controls for the next couple of seasons? And then, until the season starts, we're kind of in that dull interregnum where there's not a lot going on. There's still going to be features every day on the website. I'm still going to do these. I think Tyler is going to start doing some of the, the chats during the week as well. So there's going to be stuff to do. There's definitely going to be things to talk about. It's just... Bring back baseball. I don't want to wait. I want it now. Considering going to spring training, it depends on how much time I can get off of work, but I, I haven't been since the Indians played spring training in Winter Haven when I grew up in Orlando, so it would be nice to go again. Spring training is like paradise. If life could be like a week at spring training, then I think the world would be a beautiful place. Truly beautiful. Carrie's going to spring training. I'm envious. One of these days, one of these years, some decade, I want to do the spring training like experience where they give you the uniform and you get to pretend that you're a major leaguer for a couple of days. I'm sure it costs thousands of dollars, but just to be on that kind of field with a glove and a ball and a hat, I think that might be worth it for someone who is into baseball as I am. Um, please, someday. Here's some news about the Mike Napoli. They met on Monday. They have an open dialogue still, even though the Indians weren't able to come to an agreement with Napoli at that point. And that's from Chris Antonetti on MLB Network as well, so pretty straightforward there. It's not like it's coming through Ken Rosenthal from MLB Trade Rumors from a guy in his bedroom like me running a web show. Encarnacion's been linked. Yeah, he's the guy. Trumbo has been linked. I don't know how I feel about Trumbo. I've heard him possibly going to the Rockies is picking up steam, which he could probably hit 55 home runs at Coors Field alone. Uh, Chris Carter and Adam Lind have also been linked. Not really interested in either of them. But for now, that's, that's kind of the only rumor that's going on. Uh, the other thing that the Indians are looking at now is... Uh, Matt posted something about this this afternoon. The Indians are still poking around about some left-handed relievers. They picked up Hobie Milner in the Rule 5 draft. And, of course, they have Andrew Miller, the one true god of the slider. So, apparently, they have done some shopping. They picked Tim Cooney up off of the waivers. We know that. Uh, Edwin Escobar they picked up off waivers. So those are a few guys that they're going to take a look at here. But it does sound like they're doing a little bit more shopping. Matt mentions Boone Logan, who's kind of 
a guy out there who might be someone they want to take a look at. But here's the thing is, if you're a closer, you're apparently worth $15 million to a major league team now, which I hate, I hate, I hate the idea of closers in baseball. I think it's the worst possible way to use an elite pitcher. I think it's great that teams are going on and giving five-year, $80 million contracts to these guys. But at the same time, I'm glad the Indians haven't been giving them out. If you're going to use an elite reliever, it should look like what Andrew Miller's doing and has done with the Indians. Uh, I, I don't begrudge Cody Allen at all. That's his role. That's what he's accustomed to. I just... I feel like if you're a team and you have a pitcher who doesn't pitch 60 innings in a year and suddenly he's costing more than the guy you have playing second base 160 times a year, something's a little off there. Uh... It's great that these guys can go out and get these huge contracts. It's great that the Indians aren't signing them. I just think it, it it surprises me that teams don't trade closers more. That's something that the Oakland A's did a little bit in the early Moneyball days, is they would have a closer, he would rack up the saves, his value would increase, they'd flip him for prospects. I, this seems like the best possible time for teams to do that now. I... Like, if, I don't want the Indians to trade Andrew Miller. I want him. But if they traded Andrew Miller, they could probably get a farm system. They could probably do what the White Sox just did with the Chris Sale trade and pick up a guy like Moncada, who's probably going to be an all-star infielder. And the White Sox pretty much went from having the 25th best farm system to a top five farm system in a couple of deals. Between the Eaton trade and the Sale trade, they made out like bandits. So it's surprising to me we don't see teams do that more often. Where, if you believe the numbers, I do, relievers aren't as valuable as we make them out to be. They're not as valuable as they seem. So if you can trade a guy who's worth, at best, two to two and a half wins per year above replacement and pick up three or four guys who might be cornerstone pieces in the future while decreasing your payroll. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is, come watch me play out of the park this offseason and trade all of the relievers for prospects. <laughs> Whew. There's a few other things going on here. Starting pitching death. Death. Please no starting pitching death anymore. Sorry. Uh, starting pitching depth. It looks great for the Indians right now, I think. I just want to pull up the current 40-man roster so we can take a look at everybody who's involved at the moment. Just from top to bottom, the Indians here have Corey Kluber, Carlos Carrasco, Danny Salazar, Trevor Bauer, Tomlin. <coughs> We've also got guys like... Where'd they go? Interestingly, this is still listing Zach McAllister as a starting pitcher. That's funny. Uh, Ryan Merritt is knocking on the door. Clevenger is knocking on the door. And one of Tito's thoughts is, as soon as you think you have enough starting pitching, you go out and get another arm. Because you never know. We had those concerns with Salazar's elbow towards the end of the year. He's already had Tommy John once. There are some people around the game who expect that he's going to need it again someday. Dear God, please no. No. But knowing that that's a possibility, it's good for them to have these guys that... And all seven, all seven of those guys, I think, are major league starting pitchers. Clevenger, I'm excited about. Merritt had one of the best spot starts of all time in the playoffs. So I'm looking forward to seeing what those guys do this coming year. And it's it's good that we still have that kind of depth, too, because we did trade Justice Sheffield that a lot of guys thought could be eventually like a three or four in a rotation in the major leagues. 
One thing I have heard that's interesting to me is the thought of picking either Clevenger or Merritt to be the fifth guy next year with Tomlin as a four and use Bauer as like the other relief face. You've got Miller who'd be the lefty guy, then you have Bauer who's the righty guy. I still think Bauer deserves another year to see if he can be good Bauer for 160 innings or so instead of maybe just 100. But you look at some of his best performances, and the one that immediately comes to mind is the 19-inning marathon game, or however long it was against the Blue Jays, where he just comes in off the bench, wasn't expecting to pitch, and shuts him down. Um, one of the thoughts that someone had that are kind of interesting is that since he's he maybe over-prepares and is definitely a bit idiosyncratic, Maybe if you have him in the bullpen where he can't overthink things, he just has to go in and pitch, that might benefit him. Uh, I don't think any amount of thinking or preparing or research when you're not playing is going to hurt, but if you've got five days to sort of stew, maybe a guy like him, who we know is a very intelligent guy, maybe he just needs his own version of sea ball hit ball, where he's just not not getting in his head about it. It just goes up there and throws heat. Maybe. But it's good to have options in your starting pitching rotation. There are, I think, probably 25 other teams out there that don't. As far as the bullpen goes, Jeff Manship ended up getting not tendered, so he's not with the team anymore. He has gone into free agency. Uh, we've still got Allen, Shaw, Otero, Miller. Those four guys, I think, need to see the lion's share of work. Percy Garner's an interesting-looking kid that we had up for a little bit there. I have a feeling Kyle Crockett and Joseph Colon are going to be back. And then, what are the Indians going to do with Cody Anderson? We just talked about starting pitching depth, and I didn't mention him at all. So clearly, I don't think he's got it. I don't think he's cut out to be a starting pitcher because I, he's got a good fastball, but none of his other off-speed offerings are even close to being a, like a plus pitch. So he's a guy to keep an eye on too, because I think that with that fastball, if he can find one good secondary pitch, he could be a, a really good relief option. I just don't know. Maybe his ceiling is a guy like McAllister, who never really has figured out a great strikeout pitch and just sort of relies on his fastball, which, I mean, if you're a 26-year-old guy, there are worse things than making a couple billion dollars playing baseball. But I hope he does find a great strikeout pitch. So, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, and I agree, Bauer doesn't want to be a bullpen arm. He wants to be a starter, and he thinks, he, like he said, he still thinks he can be the best starting pitcher in baseball. Um, great question from Mark, which is, how have the guys we traded for Miller done after the trade? I'm going to pocket that because it deserves more than me rambling off the top of my head. Um, one of us, I think, should turn that into a post. Because we do have guys, it's Clint Frazier, Ben Heller, J.P. Fireisen, and Justice Sheffield. Fireisen is a name that, if he ends up making it to the majors, I think that he's a first ballot uh, name Hall of Fame candidate. J.P. Fireisen. Come on. It's perfect. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think I'll, one of us is going to take a crack at that and making that a full post. Uh, just to go over what happened, where they are in the other team's system now, and to speculate a little bit as to what they'll do this coming year. I think we're probably going to see Clint Frazier up with the Yankees at some point next year, as awful as that sounds. Oh, well. I'm, I, I just expect that the Yankees outfield in 2019 is going to be Bryce Harper, Mike Trout, and Clint Frazier. They're all going to be 10 wins above replacement guys, and the Yankees are going to win 135 games. 
and then hopefully lose in the first round of the playoffs to, like, the A's or something. That would be great. I could live with that if they lost in the first round of the A's. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. I want to thank you guys for dropping by. I think we went for, like, a half hour or so, even though I started a little bit late. Avoid the snow, stay warm, and until next time, let's hope the Indians find a way to pull a couple million dollars out of nowhere and sign Edwin.